Hey everyone, today we're going to begin looking at long run economic growth. In a previous unit, Unit 4, we talked briefly about how when the economy is at long run equilibrium, government policy cannot create long run increases in output. That because of money neutrality, for example, with monetary policy, um, we can increase aggregate output in the short run, but the economy generally adjusts itself back to full employment in the long run, leaving us with the same level of real output, but with higher prices. So that's not growth, that's fluctuation. So what we want to do in this unit is look at what it is that actually plants the seeds of actual permanent growth and output. And so um, we're going to start by just talking about what it means to grow. We could measure the size of the economy, and we have with GDP, which is just measuring the size of the economic pie that everyone gets to share. And we could then say, well, GDP, nominal GDP is not very helpful, so let's look at real GDP. Let's adjust for inflation and see if that pie is actually getting larger or smaller over time. And while that might be useful, what would be even more interesting is to see if that pie is getting larger for everybody. So we look at real GDP per capita and determine whether or not each individual's slice of that real GDP pie is getting bigger or smaller. So our focus will be on real GDP per capita. Within the United States, we can see that real GDP per capita is increasing and has been increasing for well over 100 years. If you use 1908 as the base year, then by 2008, we were nearly seven times larger as an economy than we were uh, before. And so clearly, there has been an increase in improvement in the standard of living for pretty much everybody in this country um, because real GDP per capita continues to grow and grow and grow. It doesn't mean that there isn't room to improve and certainly that there are people who are struggling and suffering uh, economically, but it does seem to indicate that even sort of the worst case economic situation in America today is significantly better than the worst case economic situation 100 years ago. When it comes to measuring how fast or how quickly the economy doubles in size, uh, we sometimes use what's called the rule of 70, it's sometimes the rule of 72. It's really an exponential function, looking at how long it takes for uh, something to double in size given a percentage growth rate. And so we do 70 divided by the annual percentage growth rate to determine how many years it would take for the economy to double. So when the economy is increasing at 2% a year, then it would take approximately 35 years for the economy to double in size. So the question is, why has the U.S. economy grown so strongly over the past 100 years? What is it that's driving this massive increase in the size of our GDP per capita, the massive increase in the size of GDP overall? And the answer is very similar to the answer one might give when asked, what is the secret to real estate? And when you, when you talk to real estate agents, they say, what's the secret to real estate? They say, you need to know three words, location, location, location. Well, when it comes to economic growth, you need to know three words, productivity, productivity, productivity. That's the key to economic growth. The more productive an economy is, the more we see increases in productivity overall, um, the faster the rate of growth within an overall economy. So anytime you're able to produce more goods with the same amount of resources, you're seeing an increase in productivity and therefore an increase in long run aggregate supply or an increase in full employment output, for example, or um, potential output. And in fact, productivity is the only way to sustain economic growth. Like we said, when you increase government spending, there's a short term increase in output, but there's always this pull back to long run equilibrium. But with sustained actual economic growth with productivity, we'll see that long run aggregate supply curve shifting to the right. And so the economy is doesn't have to shift back left because where it wants to go is moving to the right and it's continuing to increase. Now what's going to cause increases in productivity? Well, human capital, physical capital and technology improvements on each one of those three will help an economy see sustained economic growth. When it comes to human capital, we're talking about the education and training, the knowledge and skills that workers have. And so the more skills and knowledge workers are able to acquire, the more productive they can become. So for example, taking a course in how to use a new software package can really free up your time so that instead of having to hand write things or to hand calculate information with a calculator, you can use a spreadsheet or a word processor in order to create, create more work 
more quickly. So you have more output for the same amount of time. And within the United States, human capital expenditures and improvements have been rampant. So we can look at the increase in uh, college degrees. We can see that in the early 1920s, it was about two or three percent of Americans had college degrees. Today, nearly 40 percent do. And with that increase in education comes an increase in productivity. Physical capital is really the, the workers, the tools that, uh, that, that workers need to be able to do their jobs well. And so to think of physical capital, ask yourself this question. If you had to dig a hole, which would, be, which would go quicker? Which would be the better way to do it? Would it be better to just dig a hole by hand or to get a shovel? And I think we all sort of understand intuitively that the shovel, the tool, helps us to be able to do things more quickly. And again, within the same amount of time, with the same number of workers, we can produce a whole lot more work when we're provided with tools as opposed to when we don't. So the more tools available, the more capital available in an economy, presumably the more productive it will become. And finally, technology. Tools are great, but better tools are better. And this may be the most important uh, factor of all. Having better technology makes us more productive. If you think about schools back in the 1980s, they might have had a computer, a Macintosh, that people would go and use and, and the classes would go in and one person could use it at a time. And that was interesting and useful and it helped improve some of the education outcomes. But what's even better would be if every student was provided with something like a MacBook, where there could be some significant schoolwork done in the same period of time, a whole lot more output the same number of resources. And the same is true within business technology as well. So improving the physical capital that you have is an extra layer of improvement on, on productivity um, than you would have had otherwise. Now we can measure how much more productive we are by looking at an aggregate production function and looking at um, how changes in human capital, physical capital, or technology will improve the level of productivity that we have for our workers. So for example, we could look and say, okay, we've got um, office typists and we can pour money, physical capital into helping them by, by giving them um, computers to, to type and to, to fill out forms, I suppose. And we can say that the, the more money we, we put in towards capital per worker, we get a certain amount of output in return. And so first thing you may ask yourself or you may notice about this change in real output is you'll notice that as we increase physical capital by $1,000 per worker, we are getting an increase in output, but that increase in output is diminishing as we move along. We have diminishing marginal returns. So there's sort of a, an upward bound of how much output we can get by adding physical capital. Because at some point, there's just too many computers. I mean, if you've got more computers than workers, there's only so much you can do with those extra computers. You can get a little bit more work out, I guess, if you're running some sort of script on one computer and you can turn and work on another. But generally speaking, there's sort of a, a maximum amount, right? So we can graph this information on a graph and we would see then that as we're increasing physical capital per worker, if I go from $1,000 worth of physical capital per worker to $2,000, well, I'm going to have an increase in uh, output per worker. That's true. Um, so we're just moving along the production function. So spending more money on physical capital or human capital uh, will we'll certainly increase the level of productivity and give us more output per worker, but it's what would be even better would be to shift that curve. And in order to shift that curve, we have to improve the physical capital itself. And we see that because instead of spending more money per worker, I'm still spending here in this example $1,000 in physical capital per worker, but that $1,000 in physical capital is better technology and it's allowing my workers to produce even more output for the same amount of spending. So anytime you see an increase in output with the same level of physical capital per worker, it's telling us that the technological tools that are being made available are increasing in their effectiveness. All of this can be graphed on the production possibilities curve. And you may recall way back at the beginning of the unit or the beginning of the course, we said the production possibilities curve along the outside of it is showing us all of the efficient levels of production that an economy can enjoy. That is, it's efficient because I can't make more of one thing without making less of another. And so if you're along that pro production possibilities curve, it's sort of the maximum that you can do. Now, there's, there's no one's better than the other kind of um, choice here with A, B, C, and D. It's whatever the economy and the people within that economy 
choose um, to pursue. But so point A, B, C, D, they're all the same in some regards. They're all efficient. If you're at point F, that's going to be inefficient. And the reason it's inefficient is because I can produce more of both goods without having to produce less of something else. We're in a recession here. This is essentially a recessionary gap. And so there's room to improve uh, the, the quality of life without having to make any sort of sacrifices. And then we've got point E. And E is sort of not attainable. It's not possible. I don't have the resources to be able to achieve point E currently. I'd like to get to point E. Point E would be awesome. Point E is more of both, uh, in this case, trucks and cars, and that would be ideal. And so we can get to point E, but it's going to take actual real economic growth. As we improve our productivity and increase the, the, the amount of goods that we can produce with the same amount of resources, we'll begin to see that production possibilities curve shift out to the right. So that in this case, point E ceases to be impossible and is actually, in this example, now inefficient, that we could actually produce even more of both goods as a result of this increase in long-run growth. So that's a quick overview of sort of the general concept behind growth, and we'll spend some more time in class talking about it, and we'll move on to looking at some specific policies that may also help facilitate this increase in growth over time.